everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I know there's a lot of exciting things happening right now outside of this talk and even outside of GDC. So thanks for coming uh, and hanging out, talk about fighting games for an hour. Um, this is a kind of a dense talk, so I'm going to move a little bit quickly. Um, I'm going to start. Oop, my music is still going. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this talk is called uh, 0919, a decade of approachability in fighting games. Um, real quick, kind of about myself. I. You know, I've always been a kind of a casual Smash Brothers, Street Fighter player. Um, my first job kind of adjacent to the gaming industry was at Major League Gaming. Um, after that, I got involved with a project called Sports Friends, um, worked on a game called Bara Bari Ball. Um, more recently, I've been working at the Mighty Iron Galaxy. I kind of hired, got hired on there to work on Killer Instinct. There's my two favorite characters on the bottom, uh, Agonos and Cinder were really fun to work on. Um, yeah, so we worked on seasons two and three of Killer Instinct. Um, a couple notes about terms. I am using like the, the terms approachability and accessibility interchangeably. Um, I know like colloquially we, we talk about accessibility in fighting games in terms of like, oh, make them easier to play and so on. Um, I wanted to avoid suggesting this talk was about designing for disabilities, which is important, but that's not what we're talking about today. Although if you are interested, uh, there was some great work done on the audio side of Killer Instinct, and you can read about that. I also recommend gameaccessibilityguidelines.com. Accessibility um, a few other notes. Uh, I have like a big tent for fighting games, so in my mind, like Street Fighter, Soul Calibur, Smash Brothers, even like Nidhogg and Dive Kick, they all have like enough in common that we can kind of talk about them in the same breath. Um, I'm also kind of in the unusual position of talking mostly about games I haven't worked on. Um, so, you know, if you see something you worked on here, and maybe I say something critical of it, of it today, know that you know, this is coming from a place of love and respect and like I spent a lot of time thinking about these games and you know, thinking about how to make them better. Uh, so I wanna start by talking about a period of time that's generally roughly between like 1999 and 2009. Um, if you read a lot about fighting games or talk to a lot of people who play a lot of fighting games, um, you can maybe hear this term like the dark ages, right? So this is like the period of time between roughly the final version of Street Fighter 3 and like the console release of Street Fighter 4 in the US. Um, it's a total misnomer. Uh, there's actually a ton of interesting games released during this period of time. Uh, it's really more of a Street Fighter dark age, uh, but you know, since Capcom was and kind of is still like a symbolic genre leader, um, the story that often gets told is that Street Fighter 3 was like a very demanding game with like a, you know, new mechanics, like the difficult parry system and so on. Uh, and it was inaccessible, so it kind of didn't retain the massive Street Fighter II audience that Capcom, you know, expected and desired. Uh, and you know, around that time, fighters kind of like fell out of mainstream consciousness um, until 2009, Street Fighter IV came along, and that like felt and still feels kind of significant, like kind of the closing of one door and the opening of another, like the beginning of a new era. Um, so if we call that time between Street Fighter III and IV the Dark Age, I want to suggest that the time after it uh, we call the Expansion Age. So Street Fighter 4 is a perfect example of like how this was kind of kicked off, right? This is a game that had more approachable mechanics and kind of online play for the first time and colorful, colorful 3D graphics uh, and you know highlighting the original cast. So this is all to me seems like a deliberate attempt at kind of appealing to a larger audience, like a broader audience, uh, not just people who had been playing and continued to play fighting games, but um, people maybe nostalgic for Street Fighter 2 or people who ne maybe never played Street Fighter but just know like iconic characters like Chun-Li and Guile and so on. Uh, so yeah, so this expansion age, that's like the period of time we're in now, and we've been in for a while. Um, the defining characteristic to me of this time is developers kind of putting priority on making their games easier to play, uh, easier to understand, more accessible, more approachable. Um, and you know, we see this through how developers communicate with players. Uh, if you've read any interview with, with almost any fighting game studio, you'll often hear things like, oh, the game is as deep as ever, but it's easier to play. Um, regardless though, this doesn't really seem to have been as successful as many people might have hoped. It's still common to even see players talk about being intimidated. Uh, even players that you know, play a lot of games, players that consider themselves hardcore gamers. It kind of reminds me, growing up, something that a lot of people, you know, music fans would say, oh, I listen to everything, but not country and rap, right? It's like, almost like fighting games are kind of the country and rap. It's maybe even worse, because there are people who want to play these games and want to get into them, but just can't figure out how. Um, before we talk about why that is, I want to kind of make something that's, make the case kind of against this process, like, like a case, a critique maybe of the expansion age, which I think is a little unusual, um, especially from a developer. But I think it's worth articulating. Um, I think 
the, like the, the first thing is there's kind of like a romance of about difficult art, right? There's a, in, in, in fighting specifically, that kind of mass, manifests itself in a fear of uh, like diminishing or like removing the value of skill, like feats of skill. Tom Cannon, uh, one of the founders of Evo, calls this the drama of humans under pressure. Um, and I can relate to this, like as a player and as a spectator, I think part of what is so great about fighting games is how they're so expressive and like allow for so much variety um, and reward skill. Like they're games that don't come to you in the way that a lot of games now do. Um, and I don't think that's like invalidating. I don't think that's bad. I think difficult art is great. I think composers like Schoenberg and Ornette Coleman and you know performers like Lightning Bolt or Sonny, Sonny Sharrock are all examples of kind of art that you need to um, you kind of need to work a little bit to appreciate it, right? I don't think that's that's bad. There's also a fear of kind of becoming too esports, which to me means a little too mainstream or like too dry and too commercial. Uh, and I can relate to this also. Like I think there's this desire to emulate professional sports that's a little off-putting. Um, for the one thing, like there's this emphasis on organizing around spectatorship versus participation, which uh, just is a little less interesting to me personally. Um, then there's the question like, do we even know how to do this? Like, so as a developer, I don't know that we actually know how to make these games more accessible. And there's a sense in which kind of tackling a problem that you don't understand yet is like experimental surgery. Like it's unpredictable and weird. Uh, my friend and collaborator Richard Terrell has a great example of this process where he kind of likens it to attempting to like kind of squeeze a balloon in your hands. And when you try to do that, like, you know, the air escapes between your fingers and then you kind of patch that up and then it just moves and escapes somewhere else. It's like not solvable. Um, and I think we'll see a running theme of this talk is gonna be unintended consequences and like weird side effects. And then finally, like, well, maybe they're already accessible and people just don't like them, uh, which we'll come back to. Uh, there's also a case for accessibility, of course. Um, you know, most prominently, it's possible that the design of fighting games has just become overcomplicated and confusing over time. Um, you know, many modern fighting games are the result of like a very long tradition of building on existing work and kind of piling on prior knowledge that kind of makes it difficult for players and developers who are like steeped in this stuff to kind of understand how complicated it is, um, how it looks to a newcomer. Um, there's also the fact that games are expensive. Uh, if you make a fighting game and you wanna make another game afterward, that game has to make money, right? You have to recoup, especially as like games become more online and more games of a service model kind of become more expected. Uh, this just gets harder and harder. Then there's the fact that games kind of are a little bit unique to me and that they kind of need to be activated by their players in a sense. There's a, there's a sense in which when more people play a game, they kind of reveal all the weird, cool, fun aspects of it that are, you know, they're there in the code as like potentialities, but you kind of need people to care about them and play them and kind of put pressure on them to kind of help discover like the cool truths about the games, right? Like seeing people do crazy things like this tool assisted combo uh, is kind of just inspiring and awesome. Like there's a value into that to me uh, just in and of itself. Uh, and then finally, you know, developers love fighting games. Like we do this stuff because we care about it and we find something valuable in it. Uh, and we actually do want to share them with the world. So more access, more people is kind of, is good just for that. Uh, you know, you want to see more, more of the stuff that you like. So if it's not clear, I land on like the four side of this argument. Um, but I think the concerns on the against side are pretty serious. Uh, and if this talk has a thesis, it's that I think this is a more difficult or like at least a different process than most people appreciate. Uh, this talk is gonna try to help understand what developers have tried, uh, what works, and what doesn't work. And then at the end, I'm gonna try to offer some thoughts about maybe what the next 10 years could look like. Uh, we're gonna talk about design, kind of rules and features in a game, and then input specifically the stuff between you know, the player and the characters. So design, uh, there's a lot of stress around fighting games about like how to learn how to play or, or the right way to play, right? Um, so I wanna kind of start by asking like, is there actually just something inherently inaccessible about the design or the nature of fighting games? Uh, in other words, like, are these questions and stresses actually really more intense than in other games? Uh, and you know, maybe they are. Uh, fighting games are head to head, they're zero sum, meaning if I'm going to lose, you win. Um, actually in Killer Instinct, there was a brief period of time where there was a bug where the you know, people playing online, their inputs would get, go out of sync, so both players could win. Killer Instinct was briefly the perfect fighting game. Um, <laughs> But you know, usually it is zero sum. <laughs> um, so when you do lose, there's no one to blame, which, is, which can be stressful, obviously. Uh, in order to improve, you have to interact with strangers, which is even more stressful. And then you, know, you also need to kind of examine your own behavior, which is maybe supremely stressful. Uh, but you know, that's all true of all the most popular enduring 1v1 games. None of that is unique. Uh, but fighting games do kind of have, on top of this, uh, what I consider like a pretty unique set of features. Um, for the one thing, obviously they're real time, so this is an action game where execution and strategy are both important. 
there's no randomness uh, generally. Like we know that randomness kind of has the effect of like softening uh, the effects of skill. It kind of brings players closer together at disparate skill levels. And so you know, fighting games don't have very much of this, and maybe as a result they're more stark and like a little bit tougher than than a lot of people are used to. Uh, fighting games also have perfect information, meaning there's nothing that you know one player has access to that another player doesn't. I can see everything on screen. There's not really anything um, that you're hiding from me. For pedantic people in the audience, I'm gonna uh, fix this a little bit. Yes, like there are characters like Game and & Watch and Peach that have random properties. Uh, and you know, you can think of like charge characters like Guile as having information. If you can't see what I'm doing with my stick, maybe I'm charging, uh, maybe I'm not. Um, so if we look again at like our top games, none of them really have this combination of properties, right? Chess, Go, all these classic games are not real time. Hearthstone, Magic, also not real time. Uh, and then they are on top of that heavily random with tons of hidden information, uh, Clash Royale is real time, but it's kind of random and there's a little bit of hidden information. And then weirdly, uh, to me, StarCraft II is actually the closest we get. It is real time, it's not random, uh, but you know, because there's separate screens and because there's fog of war, there is a lot of hidden information. Uh, so I don't think this means like the design of fighters is inherently flawed or limited, um, but maybe they cut a little closer to the bone than a lot of other games. Um, so unless you're especially gifted, you're gonna lose a lot before you become decent at these games. And when you do lose, it can hurt uh, quite a bit. I think maybe this is the biggest impediment towards kind of mainstream embrace of these games now. Uh, but you know, at the same time, maybe the biggest gift that these games to have and kind of, kind of the reason why there's so much, what in, seems to me to be like unique passion kind of energy around people who do play these games. Um, I know me per personally, like I kind of think of fighting games as a reality check versus as opposed to like a power fantasy, right? So many games now are kind of about empowering the player and making them feel like something maybe they're not, whereas like fighting games will very quickly show you exactly what you are, and like where you, where you sit. Um, there was a couple other things I was gonna say here, but Patrick Miller actually just wrote a great article about what he gets about these, uh, out of these games, and I just suggest people will read that instead because he's much more articulate than I am. Uh, so first, first thing I wanna talk about is like training modes, trial, story, these are generally single player activities uh, intended to help people learn how to play. Um, so training modes, for example, like in theory, these are like a safe space for players to kind of experiment and train, not have to worry about what other people are thinking or doing. And they're very, very good now. We have replays and save states and AI settings and recording and lag settings and all sorts of great features. Um, there's a couple issues, like learning how to use a good training mode is actually more involved than learning many other single player games entirely. Uh, they're also entirely self-directed, so there's no real motivation to use something like this unless you already care about getting good at the game. And they're also not very effective unless you know how, why, when to train and so on. Um, there's also an interesting unexpected side effect of these modes in that like in a game that has a good training mode, the people who want to get good and know how to good, get good can get good very, very quickly, uh, which can kind of separate the, um, you know, the skills of the player base in a surprising way, I think. Uh, you know, we also have trials. So these are more directed. Uh, classic examples, Street Fighter IV has, um, you know, combo challenges for each character. Dragon Ball Fighters has a series of kind of tutorials about mechanics. Uh, on the extreme side of things, Under Night and Birth has this amazing, massive interactive manual. Uh, then we have you know, more interactive tutorials, so Guilty Gear Exert and Skullgirls did an excellent job um, in this. These, these kind of go beyond just telling you how the game works and kind of start teaching you concepts. So in this Skullgirls example, the player needs to block a series of attacks from the computer and then when they block it successfully three times, they can move on to the next lesson. Um, so this is cool because it's like, it's actually just teaching concepts, right? It's kind of repeating and confirming knowledge and can be very effective. Uh, and then on the story mode, like single player side of things, um, we have a lot of single player non-competitive modes. Uh, typically these are kind of kind of perfunctory, like a series of fights um, against AI. You know, traditionally you, you go through the whole mode and at the end you get a bit of dialogue or a bit of story. Modern games have like taken this to an extreme. Obviously the Injustice series has, you know, lavish cutscenes and like amazing voice acting between each battle. Um, we've seen a lot of focus on kind of character customization, character creation, um, lots of things for players to unlock and purchase, uh, kind of be creative with. Um, so there's a bit of a pragmatic problem here in just that these are all costly to develop and maintain. Um, so it's easy to understand why like Mortal Kombat or Injustice cutscenes are expensive, but even just a training tutorial, interactive tutorial mode, um, they're not trivial features, right? They take effort from the design team and they also take sustained kind of repeated effort because you know, these are games that change, they get patched, and you, know, you can either leave it alone and maybe teach people obsolete or bad information or go back and actually touch it up. Um, then you kind of have to question if these modes are actually effective um, or at, at teaching or even attracting people in the first place. 
I, it's possible that it barely matters because most people don't actually do them. Um, you can kind of see a very similar curve in a lot of other games. This is the dojo mode in Killer Instinct and people drop off very quickly. Um, it's also possible that, you know, games that kind of put pressure like in their, you know, in their menus and in their feature set, um, if they communicate to you that you need to research and study to play this game, it's possible that this is actually worse than doing nothing and it's like intimidating. If you look at some of the biggest fighters right now, Smash Brothers, Mortal Kombat, Tekken, Street Fighter V, these aren't simple games at all, but they kind of put less emphasis on learning. They don't, they don't tell you that you need to train, um, which maybe makes them more appealing. Like a lot of people don't like school. Um, I know act anecdotally I've seen people fall into like a training trap where they maybe feel like they can't play online or can't play with their friends until they get through the combo mode for their character and sometimes that can be very difficult. Um, on the Killer Instinct Dojo, one thing I really liked that we did was, was uh, actually encourage people to go away and stop using the dojo after four lessons. You'd go play some matches and come back. Um, there's also you know, a ton of resources for learning outside of the game now. You don't need the games to teach you necessarily because you can go to YouTube with a lot of very talented people, spend a lot of time making information easy to digest. Then as far as story modes go, I think there's a lot of room to disagree about how kind of important and expected these kinds of features are, but it's not clear to me that they're like actually appealing to people who don't already care about these games necessarily. Um, I don't know if they solve any accessibility problem beyond does this game have enough bullet points on the side of the box to like seem like a good purchase, right? Um, like I said, these are typically just a series of fights against AI, which is repetitive. Um, a common way people have been obscuring this recently is by putting players on a map so they can kind of self-direct and move around and kind of feel like they have more agency over what's happening. But you know, then it becomes harder to kind of create a difficulty curve that makes sense or teach players because uh, you know, they can go where they want. Um, encounters become either way too easy or way too difficult. There's also a trend towards adding modifiers and RPG mechanics to kind of add variety to fight it to the fights and maybe allow grinding to help players that are struggling. Uh, you know, personally, this is always frustrating to me because I end up spending a lot of time in menus in this kind of game and I, when I pick up a Smash Brothers or, or a Marvelous Capcom, I don't expect to, you know, be navigating menus for, for most of my time. Um, so as like a design challenge, I think there's something really alluring about the idea of like the great single player fighting game that maybe will like ambiently teach people how the games work by having, you know, have fun while they're doing it. Um, I am still a little skeptical, uh, you know, unless you're working on a project that already kind of has a massive built-in fan base like a Smash Brothers Brawl or a Injustice, uh, you know, if your solution to a design problem like this is just make another game and put it in your game, I think you're, it's a difficult path, right? That's a very expensive pursuit. Um, next up is kind of pacing mechanics. So this is like, kind of like mechanics and rules that attempt to influence or color the flow of a game. Uh, the thinking here is generally, well, what do players hate? They hate getting steamrolled and losing badly. And what do players love? They love tension. They love like close matches and kind of upsets. Obviously, competitors would not prefer close matches and upsets. They'd prefer just to win. And, but you know, generally, players and spectators actually do prefer uncertainty in, in their games, right? Uh, none of these mechanics are especially new, but they're kind of more ubiquitous. Um, Nonlinear health bars, kind of deceptive health bars is a classic example. And Marvel's Capcom 3, for example, the health bar kind of extends beyond the X there. So there's hidden health that you can't actually see. Um, Blaze Blue, Street Fighter V, do something kind of similar where once your health is below a certain percentage, all incoming damage is reduced. Um, you know, this is kind of cool. Like it, it kind of obscures the true game state so that it appears that the players are closer to losing than they actually are, which, you know, maybe if you don't know what's happening, it can kind of create tension. So that's kind of cool. Uh, there's also comeback mechanics, classic example of Marvel's Capcom 3's X Factor. Also, Dragon Ball Fighters has sparking. These are kind of mechanics that become more powerful the longer you wait to use them. Tekken 7 has something similar with Rage Art. There's like a super move that becomes available when you're low on health. Uh, Killer Instinct, Instinct Mode, again, a meter that fills as you take damage, and then once it's full, you can activate it and you know, briefly get access to like new exciting mechanics. Um, so yeah, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, even just outside of the context of fighting games. I think when done well, like these kinds of like rules on top of the game can give a game like a heartbeat or a pulse, like an arc that's really nice. Um, if done poorly though, it can be very predictable or you know even worse, exploitable. Um, if it feels like a lot of gameplay kind of revolves around this mechanic, it's probably too impactful. Like I think it's easy for these things to become a little too important. And then you know of course there's an obvious cost to just piling on meters and mechanics and like extra rules that are outside the basic gameplay. Um, you know, for a lot of people, just the punches and kicks are enough. Um, you know, it, it's easy to see why this might be overcomplicated for some people. Um, so then finally we have rewards, right? So we live in a time where it feels like we are, most games are bending over backwards to reward players for playing, right? That's, that's uh, very much the time that we're in right now. And a lot of fighting games are doing this as well. Um, there's a lot of mechanics kind of borrowed from mobile games. You see in Street Fighter V, Killer Instinct, you get a daily login bonus when you um, play the game. You have in-game missions that you can use to win currency. 
Uh, here's me playing Final Fantasy Dissidia, getting rewarded for jumping three times and using a special move 10 times in Killer Instinct. Uh, we also have unlocks. So there's like aesthetic unlocks, like the gotcha, there's a gotcha game in, in uh, Guilty Gear where you can kind of unlock uh, costumes and colors and avatars and so on. Then we have kind of more mechanical unlocks. So famously, Smash Brothers has you unlock 70 some different characters and uh, arms, for example, has you unlock arms that you attach to your fighters to try to change their properties. Uh, obviously, it's probably more exciting to like unlock King Day to Day than uh, color for a character you might not even use. But there's a cost. You kind of like delay the player having access to the full game. You'll make your tournament organizers miserable. Um, that's definitely a balance there. And then there's the most meaningful rewards, right? So cash and clout. Uh, a lot of developers have been organizing their own tours, their own tournaments. And you know, obviously, most people will never get to stand on that stage. But the idea that you could, um, or the idea that it's rewarded to like be that good, is definitely appealing to a certain type of player. Um, so I think if you believe complexity is a barrier to accessibility, these are not solutions to the accessibility problem. Um, they may aid retention, but I think as these kind of mechanics become more and more ubiquitous, and I think we're at that point now basically, I think they probably will start to become a lot less effective. Um, and you know, there's kind of an air of pandering and maybe it makes it feel like your game is, isn't confidence, like has a lack of confidence that's compelling on its own when you overdo this, like you can shower rewards on players. Um, and it can actually be quite risky. Like this is a little outside of the scope of this talk, but there's been a lot of talk at GDC in the past of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Um, and you know, long story short, we there's a lot of research suggesting that when rewards are contingent and expected, meaning uh, you know how and when you'll get them, they can actually damage players' motivation like pretty severely. Uh, so next up is input. This is notoriously like the most intimidating aspect of the genre. The idea that execution is a barrier to entry uh, that you might need to like, if you can't throw a fireball, you might need to practice before you can do that is a tough sell to a lot of people. Uh, it's possible these games just ask for too much precision, like too much dexterity. Uh, this is also not a new concern, like the original Street Fighter cabinets, uh, you can see on the right there, they experimented with like the six button layout we know and also this kind of weird pressure sensitive thing where you kind of hit the button really hard to get a heavy kick and tap it to get a light kick. Uh, a lot of mechanics that kind of we consider mainstays of the genre now, like cancels and like input buffer windows and so on, these all come out of like early attempts at making the games easier to play, uh, moves more reliable. So this is definitely not a new thing. Uh, we also have kind of hardware and cost as a barrier to entry. Uh, what kind of controller should you use? Like that can be a big question, especially in a game like Smash Bros. You have a lot of options. Uh, do I need a stick? What kind of stick do I need? Um, then we have kind of experimental controllers and you know issues around like modding hardware and measuring latency and kind of input lag. There's a lot of kind of overhead to kind of playing these games, um, you know, the right way. Uh, so it seems like an area where there's a lot that can be done to help newcomers. Um, there's kind of two dominant approaches that I've seen recently uh, to helping players out that I think are new and interesting. Um, assist modes are, first example, these are just like simply control options that if you turn it on, they kind of simplify the um, input requirements for various moves. There's a lot of examples of this in a lot of games. Uh, Guilty Gear, for example, stylish mode will uh, change the input system dramatically. It's a, a dedicated special move button you get and um, simplified blocking and, and much more. Uh, then we have auto combos. So these are like series of moves linked together by a single button press that you press repeatedly. Um, so you know, if a combo is a series of moves that connect without the attacker having a chance to react, uh, this is literally an automatic combo. You get a combo just by mashing. Um, so these are often like reduced or kind of non-optimal damage compared to other uh, combos in games, and they often end in a super move that like uses a resource, a meter. Um, so yeah, so assist modes are like kind of generally considered training wheels or like a crutch. There's a lot of kind of stigma around these, um, and it makes sense. Like the idea of you know on a bicycle using training wheels, there's some stigma to that as well. Uh, and as a result, like a lot of people avoid using them, even people who actually should use them. Um, you know, and you can try to avoid this by naming them something nice like smart mode or stylish mode, and I don't think it really helps. I think people know what these are. Um, there's also, I call them perverse training wheels. Like one reason they, is, is that they're very predictable, right? You kind of limit your options, so it's easier for a more seasoned player to kind of know what you're doing, uh, which kind of has the perverse effect of making you easier to fight instead of the opposite, which might be more desirable. Um, and you know, maybe they're even worse than training wheels. Like they maybe make it easier to do stuff, like stuff that looks cool, but because it's kind of cordoned off for the rest of the game, there's no graceful way to kind of grow into um, understanding like the rest of the game. Uh, I think looking at Tekken 7 is kind of an interesting example of this. They have both assist modes uh, and auto combos in a sense. Um, so yeah, the, 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 t the typical Tekken 7 input control is simple. One, uh, you know, each arm has a button, each leg has a button. 
there is a assist mode where if you hold down a new input, the shoulder button, uh, each of those kind of gets remapped to a predetermined special move. So this is fine. Like this is kind of just on top of the gameplay of Tekken 7. I think it's harmless. Um, then we have basic combos, which this is a toggle where you, you turn this on and it kind of replaces two of the buttons uh, with auto combos. So you kind of lose access, obviously, to a lot of um, what your character is, a lot of important options. So this is, to me, is kind of perverse, right? It, it kind of helps you do stuff, but like the stuff you're doing is not really playing the game. It's like being able to do short combos or even specific special moves isn't really playing Tekken. It's like maybe even worse because suggesting that it is might actually make learning how to play Tekken harder, not easier. Um, one thing that I actually like about the combo assist mode in Killer Instinct is that it doesn't, doesn't lock off the normal ways to uh, perform moves and actually you can kind of enable and disable each component of it. Uh, the combo system in KI is kind of baroque and not really gonna get into it here, but it is nice that you can kind of ease in or out of this at, at any point. Um, so, like assist modes, like the motivation behind implementing something like auto combos can sometimes feel like it's less about actually helping people to understand or play the game and more about wanting players to kind of see cool stuff happen often and early. Uh, so a common criticism that these systems kind of encourage and reward mashing, kind of like the mindless pressing of buttons. Um, and in some cases I think this is true, like Marvel's Capcom 3, King of Fighters 14 have auto combos that are kind of just a series of almost identical normal attacks. If one hits, they all hit. If one is blocked, they'll all kind of be blocked easily. There's not a lot going on there. Um, but there's a couple nice examples, I think. If we take a closer look at Linne in Undernight Inbirth, you can see her first two hits are blocked. The third hit gets through somehow. Uh, that's because, you know, that is a low, so there's a very basic mix-up, right? The defender would need to crouch block. Uh, this is an AI, so it's not doing anything. But you can kind of see how there's a little bit more going on here than just kind of mindless mashing. Um, another example is in Beerus in Dragon Ball Fighters. Uh, his auto combo kind of has a built-in gap and like a built-in left-right mix-up. You can see, again, his first two hits are blocked. He kind of skates underneath Frieza. Because this is a traditional 2D fighting game, you know, you need to hold a way to block incoming attacks. But now he's on the other side, so the, the defender would have to change the direction they're blocking. Um, so this kind of, this is nice. Like, they're not optional, right? These are a part of the game. They're not something you turn on or off. You can't decide that you're, that you're opting out of this because you're embarrassed by it or whatever. They're also integrated into the game context. They're made up of you know, cancels and they use hit stun and they kind of have mix ups and gaps and so on. Uh, they almost kind of become like a character balance tool at low level um, play and maybe a teaching tool. Um, if you are just someone who's mashing or you're playing against someone who's mashing, you'll see kind of important concepts like this over and over again just because they're built into to your toolkit. You'll like start to understand, oh, why did I get hit there? Why do I always get hit by that move? And maybe you'll discover well, it's because you need to block certain moves low. Um, so next is the idea that fewer buttons is more friendly, like less intimidating. A lot of new games have relatively simple controls. Uh, of course, the number of buttons that a game uses doesn't actually really tell you much how a game is played. Uh, there's long in games with fewer than six attack buttons. For example, um, Virtua Fighter V uh, has very few buttons, right? It's a three button game, but it has a reputation for being difficult to play. Uh, and that's because they're used in like complicated series and they're kind of require memorization. Like the functionality of these moves is unclear. Um, and I don't want to overstate this. Like, I think everyone in this room could learn to play Virtua Fighter V with a little effort. Um, but just from a kind of casual perspective, it's easy to understand why you might look at this and be more intimidated than looking at something like Street Fighter V, which, yeah, it has twice as many buttons, but like it has way less kind of, kind of moves and rules, right? Um, this is, it looks like the Chicago train system. That's the CTA. It is actually Persona 4 Arena. Um, this is an interesting example because it kind of just demonstrates how complicated this all is. Like, there's a ton of combinations in this game, um, despite only having four buttons and a lot of like contextual inputs, kind of overlapping inputs. Like, A, B, C is an input, and also um, A, C, D is an input, which looks kind of miserable, especially considering most people play this game on a pad. Um, but you know, actually, when you play on a pad, those are mapped to, uh, I think, the shoulder buttons or the trigger buttons, so maybe it makes more sense to think about this as a six-button game. It's, it's, it's unclear. Um, so I think number buttons is an incomplete metric. Uh, it's really more of a, the beginning of a conversation, not the end of one. Uh, you need to consider how they're used, how combination of inputs uh, and sequences, special move commands, and so on. They kind of uh, need to take that all into account. Like the number of buttons can actually just obscure the real demands uh, of a game's mechanics. We also know like learning a game is not as simple as just memorizing what a button does and pressing it uh, at the right time. There's, there's a lot more going on there as well. Uh, so if that's all true, I think it's good to know when you actually should add more inputs, right? Like trust that um, the ease of use for mid-level players should actually take priority over this questionable idea that less is always more. Um, Guilty Gear 
great example, they added the dust button, um, the sequel to the original Guilty Gear added this. It was formerly a uh, combined input, so a slash and heavy slash, I believe. Uh, this isn't just an accessibility issue. I know in this case, like, this was a way to resolve certain like option selects kind of complexities that are like maybe undesirable and difficult to resolve uh, when you have kind of combined inputs like that. But I think it's interesting for our purposes because it kind of calls out the functionality of the dust button to the player. It's like, this is so important that it deserves its own button. And it is important. It's like a big part of how guilty your combos are built. Um, Smash Brothers Ultimate also did something great with one of the aspects that was my least favorite part of the game, right? Like tilts in Smash Brothers are a button combination where instead of smashing the stick and, and pressing attack, you kind of gently nudge it like halfway between neutral and the direction. Um, a lot of people don't even know that these are moves because they're kind of hard to discover and they're small and fast and like in the heat of battle, it's really hard, at least for me personally, to like do these when I want to and not, uh, not mess them up like 30% of the time or whatever. Uh, in Smash Bros. Ultimate, they allowed you to map the tilts to uh, the right stick and you know, this is great. Like this adds a new, whole new stick for a lot for players maybe, but the game is genuinely easier to play with this. So I think it's a win overall. Um, and then finally for input, there's this idea that like a lot of the fun and depth in these games comes from the way that the characters are different, but like what if they were less different? Uh, Smash Brothers again is a classic example of this. You don't have to learn different inputs for every character. Everyone, once you kind of internalize the fact that there's a special button and attack button, you combine those directions, you can kind of pick up most, most characters pretty easily. Uh, more traditional fighters have been doing this as well. Uh, a lot of like the tougher special move inputs, like 360s, half circles, even dragon punches are kind of starting to fade away in a lot of games. Um, Pocket Rumble has done some interesting stuff with like diagonal inputs and, and diagonal inputs with holds. Uh, Rising Thunder and the upcoming Grand Blue Fantasy Versus uh, put special moves on individual buttons. Um, while it's on the screen, I just want to highlight Rising Thunder is actually an eight button game but it's probably, as far as like traditional fighters go, easier to play than almost anything we've talked about so far. Like every button has a very deliberate, distinct purpose, and there's not a lot of overlap, a lot of, a lot, not a lot of combinations. Um, there's also kind of a trend towards what I'm calling like dedicated functionality. Uh, we mentioned Fantasy Strike Rise of Thunder, they, they put specials on buttons, but like if we look at the kind of an abridged history of the Marvel's Capcom series, I think it shows something interesting as well. So like all three of these games use six buttons. Marvel's Capcom 2 kind of started introducing um, two assist buttons and made the medium uh, attacks a little bit dip more difficult to do as a result. Uh, and then Marvel vs. Capcom 3 kind of continued this, added a launcher button, which just like we were talking about with Guilty Gear, it's a great way to like highlight that this is something important, like something to pay attention to. It kind of reveals it um, you know, at the cost of another normal attack button. But there's so much else going on in these games that, it's, that, that I think that worked out fine for them. Uh, and then finally, like, what if we did the same thing with combos? So what if most characters could kind of string together moves uh, with the same inputs? Uh, we see this in a lot of older games also. So X-Men, Children of the Atom, and Darkstalkers kind of introduced this concept as a magic series, but a lot of more modern games are even more freeform. Street Fighter Cross Tech, and you can go from any uh, button to like a higher strength button. Dragon Ball Fighter is very similar. You can kind of end it with uh, key attacks or supers. On our inbirth, you can press pretty much any button in any order as long as you don't repeat and you can mix in kind of crouching to get even more variety there. So these aren't um, the only combos available in these games. Obviously, they're, they're just combos that are available to like most characters and they're usually very easy to perform so they have generous buffer windows and so on. Um, it's also interesting to note that Dragon Ball Fighters and Undernight have uh, auto combos in addition to this so you can kind of like start integrating you know, magic series into your auto combo or vice versa. Um, you can also mix in special moves. Like it, it's a very like open-ended system that kind of creates a lot of ways for players to kind of optimize their combos at their own speed, right? Um, and so I think I think this is, can be really effective. I think the best thing about these trends is that they make it easier to kind of try different characters. They re, they reduce the overhead of kind of figuring out how to do stuff. Um, I think that's like a real underappreciated difficulty um, in appreciating these games for new players, especially in a game that might have you know, 20, 40, 60 characters, uh, finding and like learning a character that you like, especially if you maybe you don't even know what you like yet, uh, can be really daunting. And this may be one of the most powerful aspects of Smash Brothers' success. Um, I'm kind of calling this like knowledge portability. And yeah, I really like it. I think it's a great way for low level players to kind of graduate to mid level players. Uh, flip side of this for me personally is something like the Mortal Kombat series uh, where commands can almost feel arbitrary and inconsistent, like they don't, teach me really, and it almost feels like the game is difficult to learn for no reason, or it's like the part of the game that I dislike most, this kind of memorization, um, just takes longer than maybe it could. Um, 
And yes, so again, buttons can kind of signpost important mechanics as we talked about, dust button and launcher button. Uh, it's just a great way to tell players that this part of your game is important. Um, and then finally, like, just the idea that exceptions are okay, I think is important. So like, even if you have this broad outline, like a skeleton of a rule set for your game, if it's not always true, that's fine. Like, some of my favorite characters in Dragon Ball Fighters that I play as don't obey their uh, magic series rule. Uh, and that's okay, like maybe if that's your first character, that's a little bit of a steeper learning curve than it could have been. Uh, but just having that kind of rule that you can kind of point to, um, I think can be really helpful regardless. So to conclude input, um, I think we can kind of like look at two kind of opposing motivations or ways of thinking about action game design um, in the expansion age, and I think there's a lot of truth to both. The first is kind of trying to strip away uh, the other stuff to like get to the strategy or mind games, right? And the other is that maybe players just wanna see awesome things happen when they push buttons. Um, you know, I think there's, there's truth there, right? Like, this is great trailer moments. These are like fatalities and, um, you know, flashy super moves and environmental effects and destruction. Like, this stuff is all really cool. Um, spectacle is awesome. And like, a, lot, a, a large part of kind of the day-to-day -day work, I think, of making a game like this is actually making the stuff that the player is doing feel really impactful and kind of feel good, right, and cool. Um, I think it's a little more complicated, obviously. I think seeing awesome stuff happen as a motivation for why players play games, I think is kind of patronizing and like oversimplified, obviously. Like things like this are cool. They're really cool the first time you see them. They're pretty cool the 12th time you see them. They're not that cool like the 120th time you see them. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at tennis, right? Like imagine tennis with cutscenes. Like that's not obviously a better game to me. That's probably a worse game. Um, and it's ridiculous. And it's obviously ridiculous because we know that sports kind of thrive on like more organic spectacle. Uh, I'm not even gonna play this video because it's so ubiquitous, but um, you know, the official Evo Moment 37 probably did more to attract people to fighting games than any individual cutscene did because you, know, you watch this and you can see, you see the people, you see how they react, you know the players and you, like, you know the stakes, you can kind of see the health bar, like the rules of the game kind of create the drama and you know, that's why these games are cool. Like the spectacle's awesome, but like genuine tension is maybe more awesome. I mean, it is more awesome. <laughs> it's not maybe more awesome. Uh, so then there's the idea that the real, there's like a real game, right? Like if we could only get rid of all this unnecessary redundant execution, all this hard unpleasant stuff, this learning, maybe there's like an idealized version of Street Fighter where it's just like two minds at battle. Uh, and if we can just take that and get it out of this hard stuff, the masses will finally understand like what we love about these games. We see this like really explicitly in a lot of messaging from developers. Um, with phrases like we want to get you to the fun decision making part as quickly as possible or we want the game to be out knowing what to do or when to do something rather than how you do it, uh, ignoring the fact that doing something at a specific when is not necessarily a trivial how. Um, you know, we see a lot of games kind of trying increasingly radical and dramatic attempts at paring back their controls. Uh, Blaze Blue cross tag took away walk, which actually worked out much better than I expected. Um, but you know, we also see games like SNK Heroines, Fantasy Strike, Upcoming Metal Revolution, uh, removing the crouch input, um, allegedly because it's unnecessary, but you know, crouching like isn't really an input I have to deal with, like it's part of a stick or it's part of a D-pad, like just from a raw kind of quantity of inputs perspective, it doesn't really simplify much from that perspective. Um, and then also I'm not convinced it's actually unnecessary, like despite the fact that there's unexpected consequences, like in Fantasy Strike, for example, you can't crouch block, so you can't guard in place, you need to be walking back um, if you're trying to guard, which, you know, I'm perfectly willing to accept that may be competitively viable and like a balanced, like, well, you know, competitive game, but like games themselves are kind of unnecessary. They're not really all about function. They're not really all about results. They're not really all about outcomes. Um, there's a sense in which I think removing something that's like so fundamental kind of changes the experience, right? It's just different. It's, um, there's a cost and flow and engagement and familiarity. Um, I'm definitely not arguing against making these games more playable. I think anyone who knows me knows I'm not someone who fetishizes execution at all, but I just wanna push back a little bit to, against this idea that there's a real game and that someone gets to decide what it is. Uh, I, I think when you, another way to think about this, like about what gets lost maybe when we reduce or remove execution like too much, um, Magic or Gathering, for example, is that a, would Magic be a better game if you didn't have to remember what cards were in your deck? Like if you had a spreadsheet and you could check them off when you draw them so you know exactly what's coming and like how many lands are left? Like we could do that. We can make Magic easier to play. Like who's to say that it's not fair that I have to, that, you know, that it's fair that I should have to memorize that stuff. Memorizing, memorizing stuff is hard. Um, but you know, people don't play Magic like that. Like Magic is what it is. Like the, the tension, like the stresses and the, the pressures are, are there. 
uh, Clash Royale, right? Like, should that game show me what cards my opponent could be playing and like what their current energy is? Like, I can derive that stuff if I pay attention and think about it, but like, you know, expending that mental energy is part of what the game is. That's kind of the cost of playing that game. And, you know, removing it isn't obviously better to me, at least. Uh, finally, I just want to kind of want to make the case for like responsive real-time games. Uh, there's like a certain joy in like motion and control just for their own sake, right? Like when I used to play a lot of Smash Brothers, I would kind of close my eyes and see the way the characters moved um, when I tried to sleep. And that's because like those arcs are beautiful. Like there's just something cool about that. Like this is what dance is. Um, anyone who's played an instrument or you know a rhythm game knows that there's just like certain kinds of combos and actions that just feel good to do on your hands. And there's some other ones that just don't. Like there's an aesthetic quality to this stuff uh, that's really important. Then you know there's Dive Kick, right? So it's hard to imagine a simpler game that we recognize as a fighting game. And you know, in a lot of ways, Dive Kick is supremely approachable. Uh, but it's also true that playing someone who's better than you at Dive Kick feels maybe less accessible than many other games. Like when you strip down things so thoroughly, um, it's almost it almost becomes more likely that like fewer options leads to more oppressive gameplay, like gameplay that's more dominated by skill, less room for the kind of like messy uncertainty that we kind of get for free in real time games that are fast. Um, Another way to think about this is like, yeah, being able to hold the whole game in your head or like hold it in your hands, like not being able to do that, I think is actually good, right? Like that's, that's not bad, that's kind of what's great about these, like we're like kind of wrestling with something that's much bigger than any of us that none of us can ever master. That's, uh, that's actually something to, do to be valued, I think, not tried to eliminate it. Uh, yeah, so this has been a look at several trends we've seen develop over the course of the expansion era. Um, if the question is, are these games easier to play? I think the answer in most cases is yes, absolutely. But I think there's also like this other question kind of lurking behind all of this, like this whole pursuit for increased access and increased ease of use um, is maybe as much about uh, getting more people to play these games and maybe more bluntly, like how to make more money off these games. So in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how Street Fighter III kind of preceded the Dark Ages because it was difficult to play and punishing. And you know, maybe that's true. There's another version of that story though that might be more true. And that's, that story goes, in the US at that time, kind of arcades were declining and consoles were rising. And there's change in context, right? This maybe had as much to do with Capcom's strategy at that time as anything else. Um, and just like the context changed kind of in 1999, um, the context of the expansion era has had its own unique, unique set of like pressures on developers, right? We've had the rise of online gaming, the rise of esports uh, and streaming. It, this all means that like, there's a lot more money and there's a lot more um, players in competitive gaming now than there used to be. It's a lot more visible. Uh, at the same time, fighting games have fewer players than a lot of other genres. Like it can kind of feel like a niche sometimes. Uh, audience like games, audience for games like League of Legends or Fortnite just kind of makes it feel like there's a big piece of pie that fighting games don't get to eat, like we're missing out on something. So I think what developers a lot of the time are chas chasing is not really just accessibility, um, or maybe not accessibility at all, but just this kind of like broad mainstream appeal. So one path in the next 10 years is this. We just close the book on the expansion age and we start thinking about appeal as much as we do accessibility. Uh, we can take what we know and love about these games, kind of experiment with new ways of making them appealing to more different players. Um, I think it's very common to see developers like more concerned that their game is easy to play than concerned about who might want to play it or why they might want to play it in the first place. And I think this is backwards. Uh, you give people a reason to want to see and play your game, I think, you know, it, ideally you can trust that it's appealing enough to actually have them come to you and kind of put in that effort. So I don't really know what this is gonna look like. I don't know what the experimental age will look like, but you know, it might include further attempts at bringing like form and function together, like making these games a little less abstract and more effective at communicating the rules and their behavior. It might include more attempts at kind of increasing access, not just in terms of making sure people are able to play, but making more people feel welcome, kind of reducing the stigma of being new and bad. Uh, we know that no one wants to play if, a game if they feel like they're not welcome. Uh, it can include working with players, right? So initiatives like the XO Academy, uh, a training program that supports women competitors uh, started by longtime player and commentator Persia. Uh, it can also include just kind of rediscovering the value of strange, unique settings, characters, concepts, um, kind of the value of creating work that is just unfamiliar and new. Um, or continuing to like explore new goals and win conditions beyond simply reducing the player's health. So to me, what the experimental age looks like is devoting resources to features that are interesting, new, or effective, uh, while avoiding repeating mistakes or leaning on like ill-supported or unsupported truisms. 
Uh, this absolutely is also not a call for leaving traditional fighting games behind. Uh, there's nothing wrong with developing games for an existing audience or a niche audience, and there's especially nothing wrong with making things just because you like them and want to play them. But I don't think our attempts at kind of expanding our audience can be effective unless they're a little bit more clear-eyed and a little bit deliberate. Uh, the expansion era produced a lot of excellent work and made a lot of important progress. Uh, but if our real goal is to kind of broaden the audience and find new players, it's kind of a narrow perspective on its own. It's incomplete, and it might not be even the most important one. Uh, so thank you very much. So we're getting kicked out of here exactly at three, but I guess we have time for a couple questions. If anyone has any. Yeah, thanks for the talk. So you had mentioned that this experimental age potentially coming up is gonna involve a lot of risk taking. And I feel like fighting games as a genre more often than others value a lot of tradition. You know, adding a new mechanic or new feature to a fighting game tends to bring a lot of backlash with it. But on top of that, games, you know, the higher fidelity we're reaching as we're developing new titles, the more expensive they're getting and adding these experimental features are you know, it's a, like you said, a, a risk. Do you see the Titans, like, you know, Street Fighters and the Tekkens taking these types of risks or just going with the same formula now, like, now they have a working formula? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably not the one to answer that question, but, like, I mean, games like Street Fighter and Tekken have, like, a, they're, they're kind of in a tough spot, right, because they have a built-in fan base that if you do make those kind of changes, they'll understandably be upset, and I don't, you know, but they're also in a great position where they get to make more of these games, right? So I think... I wouldn't be, you know, I'd be pretty surprised if the next Street Fighter game played like Smash Brothers or something, but uh, I think there's definitely room for both, you know, traditional stuff and kind of more attempts at, uh, you know, more experimental work. All right, thanks. Uh, hi. Um, two Hello. weeks, yeah. Um, so uh, I think that, you know, the, the root of sort of this problem is that important mechanics that affect whether or not you win are, are difficult, right? I mean, that's, um, this talk, and I think, from what I've seen, most attempts have been to try and reduce the difficulty um, rather than uh, alter the importance. Mm. Um, do you think there's any room for like, you know, okay, like combos, right? Okay, you need combos, you're gonna get beat up if someone can do them and you can't. Do you think there's room and have you, do, can you think of any example, do you know of any examples of people shifting the significance of the mechanics rather than their uh, difficulty, if that makes sense? Um, that's an interesting question, I mean, I think there's long been games that aren't, you know, just about combos, right? Like games like Samurai Showdown are, you know, much more high damage and, and uh, not about really memorizing like specific inputs. Uh, and then you have games like KI, which have like a pretty unique combo system that, you know, it, it's it's got its own challenges, but like it's it's definitely very different than than a lot of other games. Um, I mean, I think Smash Brothers is a good example of that, right? Like games that have a very different win condition is maybe the most like fruitful. Uh, thing to explore, in my opinion, uh, just because it totally like changes the focus of what, what players are looking at and like how what you even need like to make a game like that work. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope so. I hope we see more interesting things like that. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, you so spoke about the the difficulty graph between you know uh, trying to get new players into the game and mm -hmm. how RNG has helped uh, doing that in other genres. In fighting games, how much are, are are fighting games looking towards that, or are they shifting towards that, or have you seen such things happen in fighting games where they add RNGs or to like basic attacks or stuff like that? Yeah, not really. I mean, Smash Brothers is the classic example of this as well, right? Like that game, you can put on crazy items and crazy levels, and anything happens. And I mean, I think it works really well for them in some cases. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, I'm struggling to think of other recent examples. I'm sure there are some, but you know, nothing is, is springing in mind. Timing based, like you're just at the right time, then you match. Otherwise, it's an RNG based on your punch power or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't think we've seen like the the great kind of way to add randomness to like a more traditional fighting game yet. I mean, yeah. I'd be very interested to see what that looks like. Oh, um, I think SNK Heroines has like random item drops or something. I, I, honestly, I'm not totally sure how that game works, but you may see a little bit of it there. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Thanks. How do you see the resurgence of the arcade? Because I know it's like in North, where I'm from, North Carolina, I can just drive within like an hour and be at four or five different arcades and they keep on popping up. How do you see arcades impacting the future of fighting games in the future as, they're, as they tend to be a social game? Um, well, you know, as part of Sports Friends, actually, like our big kind of motivating factor behind that was kind of to kind of emphasize 
how great it is to play local multiplayer games together, right? Like playing something in person with, with someone else is way more exciting for a variety of reasons, um, maybe more stressful too. I think like, we still, you know, Killer Queen is like another interesting example, right? This is like a game that's kind of taken over a lot of arcades and kind of really is like spread pretty far around the country. So I mean, I think there's definitely like an opportunity. Um, I think again, like Killer Queen is a really unique case because it requires so many players, like almost like a built-in spectacle for it to work. So I think there's um, a lot that could be done there. I don't know if we've, yeah, beyond that, I don't know if we've seen the, the, the great local fighting game yet either, but that's something I personally like would really look forward to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, I wanted to ask about non-fighting game franchises crossing over to fighting games. How much of a factor do you think that would be for the future? Because I got into fighting games because Persona 4 Arena, and then by extension, Under Night Inbirth, and then Blaze Blue, and I played Soul Calibur because 2B was in it, but <laughs> do you see that being like a very important thing for like sustainability of fighting games? Oh yeah, definitely. I, mean, I have a whole section of the talk that I cut about that, but like, I think, I think we're already there, right? Like you. Basically, it's very difficult to find a fighting game that has no guest characters in it right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of like been something we've kind of seen in the last, you know, five, six years uh, kind of become almost ubiquitous. I think it's great. I mean, it's one of the great things about fighting games is like they're so character focused and you kind of are looking at beautiful animations for most of the time you're playing the game. So it's not, you know, an obvious fit to, if you want to see Persona characters like in a whole new light, maybe there'll be a Fire Emblem fighting game sometime. That would be kind of cool. Ooh, yeah, I'm down for that. <laughs> It's <laughs> a good point. Patrick says it's called Smash. Stand corrected. <laughs> hey. Ooh. Hello. Sorry, um, it's hard to see. <laughs> um, even though games have been getting more and more tutorials, um, I feel that people's most um, learning material is still acquired outside the game. You see a possibility of a trend of uh, the, the games themselves providing players the tools to create and share tutorials for other players? Um, we've seen some games that have kind of like in-game um, examples of ways to like share replays and kind of like talk to people about them. But I mean, it's just so expensive. Like to do this stuff well, it's really adding a lot to your development cost and that you know is of questionable value in terms of making the game actually attractive to people. I, so, so I wonder, I mean, there's an interesting company now that's doing like Overwatch uh, video analysis, right? So you send them a, your gameplay and it has some tools that'll like point out things you could be doing better. Uh, and then you'll have people will kind of analyze it and kind of report back and say, here's the stuff you should focus on. Um, I'd love to see something like that. Like a lot of people suggest a clippy for fighting games. Like I've, I've heard of many developers say that something like that would be really interesting. I mean, personally, I think something like that is, you know, clippy doesn't really work, so I don't know if like the fighting game version of that would work, but I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, I just think it's tough to like justify sometimes, but um, that is definitely something I'd love to kind of see developed further. All right, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, you talked a bit about like how like arcade games, arcade fighting games has always been a big thing and how like losing to someone uh, that you're sitting next to is very different to losing someone on the internet. Do you think that like online fighting games, do you feel like that's changed the way people go about designing fighting games? Maybe it should have when it hasn't, things like that. In terms of just like how they're, yeah, like the how like design. sportsmanship kind of comes yeah, into play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, another slide that got cut. Like, there's a kind of an interesting thing, I think, that um, Killer Instinct and I believe Marvel's Capcom 3 borrowed from League of Legends, which is just like, if you have a player that's rage quitting a lot, or maybe that gets reported, um, they go into this like jail now where they're, they're only able to match make against other players that are also kind of in that punishment zone, which is kind of interesting. I don't know, I mean, a solution that kind of makes your, like a lot of these games struggle with having enough players that you can even like get a good connection against someone with like roughly your skill level in the first place. So kind of like segmenting that even further is tricky, yeah. but um, yeah, we've seen a little bit. I mean, it's, you're always in the context of like an Xbox Live or a PS4 where someone can just kind of send you a nasty message anyway. So yeah. unless you disable that, which I guess I recommend, <laughs> um, then it's hard to say how effective it can really be. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks. thanks. Cool, thank you for a great talk. Um, I know a lot of the examples you went through and showed were, uh, were console fighting games. I was curious if you had any thoughts on a lot of mobile fighting games, especially major IPs that have brought their games to mobile and touch inputs and things like that in terms of more accessible ways for people to go through and get into uh, fighting games as a whole. Um, I don't really, I, that's like kind of an area where the kind of input reduction stuff kind of gets so far that I, like I kind of just, as a player, just lose interest. Like I don't really want to play 
an action game on my phone, much less a fighting, like a, a very simplified fighting game. So it's just, yeah, I don't, I guess I don't have much to say because I don't know too much about them. No worries. Well, thank you. Hey, uh, this is a great talk. We as a genre and an industry really need to kind of band together to kind of figure this stuff out. So I really appreciate this talk. Um, my question is, is um, so for Injustice 2 post-launch, we um, kind of redid the whole tutorial and... Sorry, which, which game? Uh, for Injustice 2. Hmm. So for post-launch for the Game of the Year edition, Ultimate Edition, whatever we called it, right, like a year after launch, um, we redid everything and made it all like a la carte and let it make it be a lot less linear and trying to give players what they want and kind of break down that barrier a bit where players would be leaving the game to go to YouTube to learn a little bit and mm -hmm. just trying to make it a bit more accessible. Um, one thing that we really wanted to do was create all those tutorials within the context of the game. So something our designers were um, less interested in was the kind of Guilty Gear style of like, here's these balloons popping out and you, you know, low, medium, uh, high, that kind of stuff. I was just kind of curious on what your thoughts are with like teaching within context versus like these kind of mini game, more fun so style of when, tutorial. Well, yeah, when you, when you say in the game, you mean like as part of the story mode, like you kind of build in? Uh, well, no, I mean our tutorials start are in, in the story mode itself, I just more mean like within the context of the fight. We're not adding these extra like fun mini games to help teach you what a mix-up is versus like, no, here's a character that is blocking high, like hit them low versus the more mini game aspect. Right. Um, Do you think the mini games help? Are they better? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're probably better if you're like actually genuinely trying to learn because they, you know, you can kind of repeat them and do them over. And like, like the Skullgirls example, I like a lot because you're not going to get past that until you like kind of internalize what you need to know to like block that properly. Right. So I, mean, I think from that perspective, maybe they're more effective. Um, but I mean, given that so few people use it, then it makes me wonder. Uh, you know, maybe it almost doesn't matter, right? Like, you, you, the answer you need is the one that gets people to actually engage with it. So I'd right. be interested to know if you do you have any like metrics about how how it went. Uh, I mean, I'm sure our BI team does. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you but, should give a talk next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's just an interesting thing to be dealing with, like, the context of, like, hey, you're in a fight. This is the more strategy component of it. It's not as simple and black and white as, like, do these things. Like, you need to be in the context of the situation. And, uh, yeah, our, like I said, our designers were a little bit less interested in the more Right. mini game-ish aspect to keep you grounded and teach you the actual situation that we're trying to put you in. Yeah, I was actually just talking to my friend and coworker Isaac Torres uh, about this similar issue. Like, I, I think there's a lot of room for kind of using what we, you know, what little we know about like cognitive psychology to like help people, you know, help build these things in a way that like actually reflects how people learn. Like, you know, a lot of the problems, you go through these modes and it's, okay, here's like 60 bits of information that I kind of just swallow in an hour, and then I play the game, and I've forgotten it already. So what do right. I do, go back and do it again? Like, it kind of sucks. There's, there's probably a better way. Yeah, and there's also, I guess, a little bit of the added extra layer of like, creating these mini games is more assets, it's more resources, yeah. it's more costly, and you know, it's certainly something I think we could have overcome if, if our designers had chosen to go that route. Um, but it's also really hard to develop a tutorial for a game that's not complete yet, too. That's, yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> you have to always do this at the end. Yeah. Thanks for the oh, call. Thank you. Three more questions. What was that? Three more questions. Three more questions. So you talked about the obvious issue of great complexity and a whole lot of uh, decision depth being unapproachable to newcomers, but Divekick has the opposite problem where the decision space is small enough that an expert can retain and think ahead much more easily. Do you think there's a happy medium on that or that the solution has to be orthogonal to that decision complexity? That's a good question. Um, I think there's probably a happy medium. I mean, it's probably, but you know, it's, it's all aesthetic also. Like, there's games I like because they make sense to me. And there's games that like, I just don't play. You know, they may be great games, but they're just not for me. So it's like hard, I, there's no like objective answer. So I kind of don't even want to try thinking about it. Uh, something I think about a lot that like, I had to cut unfortunately, because this talk went a little long was um, this kind of property of like, having a real time game like creates uncertainty in that like, it's so fast, right? I'm pressing light punch, you're pressing light kick. Like I can't react to your light kick because this moves so quickly that it's like, it's not random, 
but it kind of has a lot of the same stuff that randomness gets us, which is you know meaning like, I, it's yeah, it's uncertainty, right? Which is yeah, there's a, there, there, there's no we can point to exactly why your light kick came out, but I don't know that it was going to come out. So we kind of get just by virtue of being like a complicated real time game, we get a lot of that messiness. That's what I was trying to get at with like the dive kick example. Like it has a little bit less of that. Um, and so that's why maybe playing that game against someone who's very good might be like more punishing, right? It's just something to like be aware of as we like strip things away to like get to this idealized point where it's like all mental. Um, there's maybe an unexpected consequence, which is that we lose like the, 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 the mess and like the mess does a job. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. It was excellent. Thank you. Um, when it comes to fighting games, I'm always particularly interested in how they kind of tax the human brain, right? And a lot of the stuff, you just mentioned it, right? Like, we know as, uh, as experienced fighting game players, we get to understand the limitations of our brain by trying to do things and failing and then eventually realizing that this thing is actually not possible to do on reaction, it has to be a read, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering, have you encountered other activities, like not fighting games, where you see similar kinds of, of uh, lem like mental limitations, essentially, that, that the players have to learn how to negotiate? That's interesting. I mean, I'm not much of a chess player, but I imagine like playing chess on a clock is probably similar, right? Like, you don't have time to, you know, calculate everything, so you kind of have to like find shortcuts. Um, I don't know, giving a talk can kind of be like that. Like, it would be easy to, you know, write an email and kind of respond to like everything really thoughtfully, but like in the heat of the moment, you need to really um, kind of think on your feet, which is obviously hard. Um, I think, sorry? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, that just made me think of like, oh shoot, and I guess we're over time, but also real quick, I, it makes me think of, um, you know, we, we kind of like valorize depth, right? And there's a lot of players like, this game is great because it's very deep. But then it's like at the same time when you're actually engaging with it, like so much of what playing these games well is like finding shortcuts and workarounds. Like I don't want to do the hard thing. Like even if, if the hard thing gets me 10% more value, like I'm not going to do it because I might screw up, and also like I don't really like doing things that are hard when I'm playing a game. <laughs> like you kind of find your comfort zone, like whether it's like you know mental or, or physical. I think is kind of an interesting counterpoint to like the idea that like these games are good because they are they're deep, which is also true, but like it's not the whole story. Um, was that three? One more? I'll just talk after. Is that cool? Yeah. Talk to you after. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, okay, yeah. Thanks so much, everybody.